Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for staying. It's lovely to see so many of you. Uh, my name is Tinu, I am the Associate Director here at the Gate and we are thrilled to have the Director of Liberty, Shami Chakrabarti, with us today um, to talk about image of an unknown young woman but also the issues that surround it. Uh, so Shami, I think what would be really helpful for everybody here, including myself, would be if you would just talk a little bit about Liberty, what it is, what it does. So thank you and congratulations on a, a very, very powerful piece. Um, it, yeah. It's um, almost a bit much to be coming back to talk about it straight away, even without a drink. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt that will come later. Um, I, I think it's a, a, a very, very powerful piece, and I've often thought that, um, that it's through art and drama and fiction that we can sometimes reach more people than you can through even, dare I say it, journalism, polemic, rhetoric, and even law sometimes. Mm. So I, I'm, I hope that many people have seen that piece and many more will, and it will be performed again staged again well into the future. Um, I'm the director of something called Liberty, which is the National Council for Civil Liberties, formed in 1934. 1934 is a very long time ago. Um, you might think that 2015 and 1934 are two years that couldn't have more in common. No internet for a start, <laughs> um, without all the opportunities and the challenges, many of which were brought out in, mm. in, in, in the play tonight. 1934, practically no TV let alone reality TV or CCTV. 1934, no DNA, let alone the stockpiling of innocent people's DNA. And yet, in 1934, certain newspapers would regularly run um, headlines about how awful it was that refugees were coming to this country <laughs> from Eastern Europe. 1934, the far right was on the rise, not just in continental Europe, but, but here in the UK. But the particular trigger for the formation of the National Council for Civil Liberties was that hunger marches had come from the north of the country to assemble in London's Hyde Park and they were promptly duffed up by the Metropolitan Police, which of course would never happen today, would it? <laughs> well, yeah. um, and the precise method that was used was that, um, was that some police officers went undercover as hunger marches and they behaved violently, uh, deliberately to trigger and justify a more violent police response. So that became a a national scandal and a, and a small group of people, probably even smaller than this group here, decided that something must be done. And uh, they met in the crypt of St Martin in the Fields Church, a you know, lovely old church in Trafalgar Square opposite the National Portrait Gallery. And they obviously couldn't tweet or mm -hmm. blog or Facebook or anything like that. So they wrote a letter to the Manchester Guardian newspaper saying, we have formed the National Council for Civil Liberties to keep watch over everyone's rights and freedoms, and here we are 81 years later. Amazing, thank you. Um, we've been just joined by cast and whatnot, quite yeah. exciting. Um, Congratulations. Hi, cast. Um, I think one of the things that you sort of touched on there that I think is really interesting in the piece is um, this notion of what social media can do in terms of galvanizing, in terms of creating ideas, ideas that may or may not be false in some in some instances but about the sort of curating of ideas and of information and what that can do to uh, groups of people who may be thousands of miles away from the instances in, in question and I wondered if the rise of social media for want of a better word is something that's I'd, lo I'd love to know how that's changed your practice sure. in in the work that you do in terms of the cases that you deal with and how you deal with them I think that um, the internet and everything that goes with it must be equivalent to the printing press in you know in terms of just how revolutionary that technology is and it's a wonderful wonderful thing it's democratizing it levels the playing field of communications it's easier for for protesters to um, to have a bit of a, a, a bit of a fair fight against governments and corporations and, and so on but it brings mm. brings challenges too and I hope they those were bubbling away in the piece as well mm -hmm. you know, you're out there um, putting your film uh, online, but people can trace it back to you as well, etc., yeah. etc. Et and um, so, enormous potential for campaigning, mm -hmm. for people to connect, for people to see what's happening almost instantly on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. Much harder for oppressive regimes to to oppress their people um, quietly mm -hmm. and privately. Um, however, you know there is the there is the other side to it, and in, in particular the uh, 
the real dangers to, to our personal privacy and indeed to everything that's collateral to that, like your conscience and your activism and so on. I think mm. Edward Snowden, uh, in my view, is a, is a hero for revealing the sheer scale of blanket surveillance mm. against entire populations by, by their governments. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting in the piece that uh, Eleanor, the playwright, has deliberately left it ambiguous as to where this yeah. country is or this, this place that it's taking place, which is wonderful in so many ways, um, because it allows us to see the whole world on stage um, and not to kind of go, oh, well, that's just over there, it's fine everywhere else. One thing I think that's really important to remember when we watch it and when we talk about it is that actually so many of our civil liberties are being questioned and compromised here as well. Um, and particularly, I would just really like it if you would shed some light on currently our right to protest, um, what we can and what we can't do in, and what that does to us in terms of being able to affect change. Well, there have been all sorts of restrictions placed on our rights to protest in this country in recent years. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it started over the last decade, really. Um, um, more and more uh, police powers mm -hmm. uh, to restrict peaceful protests, more and more requirements for people to make applications in advance uh, to the police before they have a protest, uh, particular restrictions in central London around uh, you know, sensitive buildings, uh, particular powers for the police to direct where you can and can't protest. And of course there isn't, um, it's not an effective protest if you're told that you can go and uh, protest somewhere completely hidden from view <laughs> in a field somewhere. The whole point of, um, of peaceful dissent, it may be peaceful but it still has to be a bit of a nuisance, it certainly has to, you know, to, to be noticed. And so there's a, there are lots of there are lots of issues about that. So yes, it it has been um, clamped down on, um, and uh, and there are all sorts of public order offences, and uh, and speech offences that have sort of mushroomed um, in recent years. Um, there there have been attempts by police forces and local authorities to charge organisers of peaceful demonstrations to say, well, it's good. the policing cost of this demonstration will be £10,000 or £100,000. Mm -hmm. If you want to have that demonstration, you're going to have to, to pay for the policing <laughs> of that demonstration. And of course, the irony is that the more peaceful and the more organised and the more sort of conventional and establishment your protest movement, mm -hmm. um, the more likely you are to comply with all of those restrictions and, and, and be impeded in that way. And actually, you know, the more anarchist you are, the, you know, the, the less <laughs> likely you are to, uh, to comply. So there's some very strange outcomes. Mm -hmm. But I think the, um, it's not just about formal police powers mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to, um, to impede protest. It's also uh, the use of undercover police officers to um, spy on what are called domestic extremists. And I gave you the 1934 example, mm -hmm. but I mean, what about Doreen Lawrence, mm. only 20 years ago? Now you know her story, and she's, yes. in my view, you know, she's probably a, the Martin Luther King of the United Kingdom in terms of what she's achieved for race equality, but we keep learning still. Mm. I mean, she's now a national treasure, she's in the House of Lords, she's in Marks and Spencer's commercials, you know, <laughs> and God bless her, because if anyone deserves it, it's Doreen. But, but we've learned, even in recent years, that you know, back in the day, when the police weren't investigating Stephen's killers, and she started her campaign and started making a, a bit of a successful campaign against the, the Met Police, they were putting undercover cops in her campaign, in her friendship circle, in her home. And what about, what about those women in the environmental movement mm -hmm. that you've read about in recent years, who went to Greenpeace meetings and formed friendships and then relationships and intimate relationships? I mean, these are not jihadis, right? These are radical vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> There's a limit to what bad corn is going to do to you. And, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but seriously, but people from the domestic extremism squad, I think they called it, of the Met Police, went undercover mm. as, as Greenpeace activists and formed intimate relationships. Father children with these women. Um, these men were part of their lives, they thought. They, they, they had relationships lasting up to seven years, and then they disappeared. And then years later, the woman finds out actually this guy was, was leading a double life. And um, what does that what does that do to people? And I'm, I find increasingly that when I go and speak about various human rights issues, that that, that activists and protesters in particular are, are feeling that mm -hmm. um, 
that concern about their privacy and are they being so you know some of the some of the paranoia that you saw mm -hmm. um, in the in the play is it really paranoia when people are being watched? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a real challenge actually, even for I think mental health professionals, because it's not completely paranoid if people are being watched, which raises the question about what is the appropriate and proportionate response mm. to the times that we're that we're living in. Because you, you, you still want to dissent, but you equally don't want to be on the police database. They, that's the other thing, the police increasingly you know, keep databases of images of people who've been on a demonstration. Why? These aren't criminals, these are just peaceful dissenters. So, hmm. so, many, so many things to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think probably a few people, or a lot of people, would like to ask questions, so I'd like to throw it open or to comments. you guys. Or comments, or just anything. Or Why don't we make this a sharing space? Comments thinly disguised as questions are the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probing comments. Would anyone like to ask or comment on anything? Oh, hello. Hi. Um, I have a question. Uh, do you think that the police are better or worse than they were? That's quite a general question. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of what you've just been saying. Well, goodness me. That's uh, than they were sort of where I. Um, well, yeah. I mean. I mean, you know. Um, I think things. that in some respects. In, in some respects, uh, they're better, but it's not. It's not a, you know. I think it's Luther the King again who said the arc of history is a long one, but ultimately it bends towards justice. But it's not even an arc; because it, it kind of goes a bit like that. And you know, we Hillsborough wasn't that long ago. What happened to Doreen wasn't that long ago. There are pockets of, of really bad behaviour. There are some systemic problems. For example, I mean, I'm, I'm a sort of recovering lawyer. <laughs> and, uh, actually, no, I'm just in remission. Um, but, um, I, I believe in checks and balances because the police are just frail people like us. I mean, again, you saw in the play that even the, even the, you know, the civilians, the dissenters, can start abusing their power too. Mm. You know, it's it's a it's it's a very complex piece, which was what I loved about it. And and police constables come from the people, and we are flawed, and they are flawed. And uh, there is good leadership and there is bad leadership, but I also believe in checks and balances. And there's been far too much unchecked police power. Uh, I suppose it started under the Blair government, and it's sort of continued mm -hmm. this idea that they should just have whatever, whatever powers they ask for. In the context of the undercover policing, do you not think it's strange that if I want to, if I'm law enforcement and I say that you're a terror suspect uh, or a or a, a serious criminal suspect, I need a warrant from a politician to tap your telephone, um, but I don't, uh, I, I need a magistrate's warrant to search your premises, but if I want to put an undercover cop in your home, in your bed, that's just signed off internally by the police. Now that seems to me to be <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> And I'm not suggesting that there isn't a legitimate proportionate role for undercover policing, but it really needs to to be signed off by magistrates, I think, because because it's the most intrusive surveillance of all because it can actually change your behaviour. It's not just monitoring you. It's um it's potentially, you know, a jean provocateur when I'm actually tempting you to do this and, and not to do that. So so yes, I think in some respects the police I think the whole Doreen Lawrence campaign has taught them a bit about, a, a little bit about race equality. And they are now subject to race discrimination legislation, which they weren't before Stephen Lawrence's murder. So that's important. So that, but there is some progress, but, but uh, there's still too much unchecked police power in this country, I think. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, do you think it's uh, inevitable that governments will legislate to become administrators of the internet? In each individual country? Well, they can try, but I just don't see it working, do you? I mean, they, they can. I, mean, I, I see that they could probably do anything they want to do. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, what. I said the worst thing about Snowden's revelations is not even, you know, what, what legislation has done or can do, it's what they were doing without any public consultation, political debate, or law. That's what's shocking about Edward Snowden's revelations. And the security state, in my view, has just been um, indignant and instead of putting its hands up and saying, yeah, we really need 
to have a proper public debate about this now, uh, which is beginning to happen in the US, by the way, more so in the US than in the UK. They've gone on the front foot and they accuse people like me and Snowden and others of being traitors just for bringing to light what's, what's gone on. And um, we were talking about the privacy and how there isn't consistency in the, in the checks and balances to, to protect it. I mean, they have been scooping up uh, people's data on an industrial scale. It makes phone hacking look like a joke. They've been scooping up people's communications data, they call it. They say it's nothing to worry about, it's just your communications data. Well, that's your web logs and your, who you've been speaking to and when, your location data on your phone which shows where you're, I mean, it's cool technology. It'll get you the nearest pizza, but it will also show um, whoever's able to access it exactly where you are. And they've been scooping this stuff up, saying, oh, well, don't worry, we're not looking at it. We're just, we're just collecting it. <laughs> and uh, we'll only look at it if you become suspect. <laughs> now, I've got to put the other side of the argument. If uh, the Home Secretary were here, um, she would say, well, you know, the internet is a dangerous place. There's bad, bad stuff happening there. There's bad stuff that's being conspired online. It can't be ungoverned, like in you know, a Somalia or something. We have to, we, we we have to watch. But I would say, well, bad stuff happens in people's homes too. Some of the worst crimes, violent crimes, sex crimes, happen in people's domestic dwellings. Is that an argument for saying we're now going to use digital technology to place um, cameras and microphones? in everybody's home, in everybody's living room, in everybody's bedroom. Nothing to hide, nothing to fear. Don't worry, we're not going to look unless you become suspect after the event. Now, I don't think people would feel comfortable with that. And if you're not comfortable with that, you shouldn't be comfortable, in my view, with the scale of, of blanket surveillance via the internet either. So they've been doing it without legislation, frankly. There's, um, they will now seek, no doubt, to... Uh, they will seek, no doubt, to control and to do it by treaties and legislation. But I think the technology is such that it's going to be very, very hard for governments to police it in quite the controlling way that they would like. So do you think that, that the people that are people like Anonymous or the Dark Net or whatever, do you think that they'll always be one, one step, step ahead? ahead. Or? Well, if you think about it, I mean, look, I'm not the, gra I'm not the great technologist here. Um, and sometimes this, the problem with this debate is that some of us know tons about technology and some of us know more about law and politics, but people try to su suppress the printing press, right? Mm. How's that working out for you, you know? And, and I, just, I just don't think in the end they can, they can succeed, but the cat and mouse game will go, will go on and on. And I don't have a problem, by the way, with proportionate surveillance of, of people or groups who have you know, who've given reasonable suspicion that they are you know, that they are planning terrible crimes. I just don't believe in blanket surveillance of entire populations or indeed of, of peaceful dissenters just because they, because they do bring challenge. That chilling speech, um, that the chilling, your chilling speech when the dictators, you know, loves everybody and thanks to the, thanks to the dissenters but then brands them terrorists mm -hmm. and um, is, um, is actually not quite as dystopian and um, as unusual as as you might think, and it, that echoed with lots of speeches I've heard senior politicians give, even in this country. <laughs> um, would anyone else like to ask? Yes, hello. Oh, um, battles. One of the things I found interesting, I don't even know if it's a question, it's just that maybe a comment, was that the image had to be fabricated to s spread its message across the world, uh, in that somewhere there was a stage managing of the image of the girl, the yellow dress, and how that came about. Um, but you also talked about, and in many ways that's a negative thing because they're spreading the word through something that hasn't happened and that has been stage managed. But in the same way, when you did you think that I didn't? I didn't no, think it was stage managed. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, well, maybe yeah. that's the wrong way. But it was it's certainly that there are different bits of fabrication about it. But it also, what you said when you started was that um, that in some ways it, it, the the poetry or art or in some ways can can write a message in another way. Yeah, I mean, that, a very important point. I mean, this was play. It's a fabrication. Right? What we've seen didn't just happen tonight. But is it a fabrication or is it a really powerful piece of truth-telling drama that makes us think and maybe makes us go and do something about it? So, um, but you're right, because in between there's propaganda and then we have different, you know, 
but um, I have to say, my reading of the play um, yeah, sorry, wasn't, wasn't that it was fabricated, but he was made to. It was, that it was made to be more yeah. than exactly what the truth well, was. Well, I think that it. I think that what was really interesting was the debate that some of the characters had about why did this particular image take off, and it was the pretty girl in the yellow dress and etc. etc. And, and you know that you know the, you know the, the speech about but what if she'd actually looked like a gorilla and or what if she wasn't pretty or etc. etc. Would it have taken off then? And that's a really really interesting um, practical and ethical debate for campaigners and dissenters actually. I mean there's that sort of um, that sort of charity porn of watching babies do, you know all the big all the big development charities do it don't they when you watch the you know watch the little children dying and, the, and you know and that was some that was some child's dignity and privacy that was being intruded on quite possibly in the, you know quite possibly in a shortened life towards the end of their life and and what rights even does the big charity have to 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 take those images and to beam them around the world in order to to get money. and that's an ethical that's a that's an ethical debate that rages on and one side of the debate is but this is the only way to get people to sit up and listen and give their money and we saw the manipulate we did see the manipulation of of um, of our dear character in Notting Hill or Kensington or wherever she was in her big house. Notting Hill. She talked about goodies and baddies as well. <laughs> well, there was that wonderful line where it sort of that in some ways that she'd been manipulated and it had been made simple. It, the message had been made easy with goodies on one side and baddies on the other. Mm. Yeah, but but at the same time, when there's a struggle. The lines get drawn. I mean, in a sense, this is why you want. This is why I believe in rights and freedoms and democracy, and and why after well, I, I started in 1934. But in a sense, an even more important moment is after World War Two, because that's when democratic people, to the slightly to the left and slightly to the right of politics, come up with the Universal Declaration and the European Convention on Human Rights, which the current government wants to walk away from, scrap our human rights. Act. The point of human rights and the rule of law is so that people don't have to descend into chaos and barbarism in order to be heard. That's the whole point. Which is why I say the existential threat to human rights in Britain right now is the is the threat from the Conservative government to scrap the human rights act. Yes. 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 Great. There's a question over here. Um, you talked a lot about um, the relationship between sort of our civil liberties and freedoms and state power. I wonder if you could say something about the role that corporate power has yeah. in terms of subverting those or reinforcing perhaps, but you know, in a way, Absolutely. arguably the greatest threat to us as individuals doesn't come from the government, but comes from unchecked corporate power. Do you know, I don't even see the difference anymore, to be honest. Corporate power, government power, it's just power, isn't it? It's just big structures of power and the way in which that power will be abused and and really human rights are to protect the vulnerable from the powerful and there are particular individuals minorities to protect them from the powerful and the, this kind of state non-state thing doesn't really make sense anymore you've got you've got private security companies doing black ops for the CIA and whatever and you've got uh, the government effectively um, leaning on leaning on um, internet companies and telecom companies to give over data and some of it is a trade for money and some of you know and, and it's um it doesn't really it, it doesn't really matter the threat that, you know the threat and the opportunity comes with this amazing cool technology which as we've discussed is really empowering for people and then on a trivial level it's it's the nearest pizza or it's the whatever it is people's dating habits etc but and that's you know that's the more trivial side of it but it's also incredibly empowering in terms of the spread of information stroke propaganda whatever it's going to be um, and just organizing you know the, the way that you can organize people in these online petitions etc is is breathtaking and wonderful but the dark side is the traceability the intrusion and, priv and a bit of personal privacy is important. It's and, and not because you're a criminal or a terrorist, but just because without it, there's no intimacy, there's no dignity, there's no trust, there's no medical confidentiality, there's no fair trials without legal uh, confidential legal counsel, there's no secret, uh, there's no fair election without a secret ballot. You know, so anything that begins to, you know, to to, to, to chip away at this kind of little bit of of privacy that people need is, is really quite dangerous, but the technology is 
is creating that threat as well as all the opportunities. Great, thank you. We probably have time for two more questions. I know there was one here, and then we'll take one more. I was wondering if, uh, what your thoughts were on the vulnerability of the individuals in the play who couldn't get a signal and how we mm. seem to be so dependent on you know, the tele telecommunication networks and uh, the social media channels. Well, absolutely. And, that's and a, should yeah. we be getting into letter writing as well, just in case? Should we be <laughs> <in>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, that's a really, really interesting question, yeah. The, the dependency, and then it's all shut down. And of course we know, don't we, from, from you know, attempted revolutions in the Arab Spring, etc., etc., or even from things like the London riots or the English riots, whatever you want to call them, that, that there are attempts always to, to shut down networks at certain times, and there's capacity to do that. But um, we should all... I, I, I'm a great one for letter writing anyway, myself. There's nothing like a thank you note that's, you know... It's a handwritten. No, um, no, I think we can. I think we can have all of the. I think we should have. We should. We, we should have all of these things. But of course, letter writing takes a little longer, doesn't it? And that's the point. If we're used to instant communication. How do we cope? But but again, in the play, I thought it was done brilliantly because on the one hand, you had the scenes where there's the vulnerability of I can't get a signal. I can't get a signal. We can't organise. We can't communicate. We're like a little little private army of dissenters who can't make the logistics work but then of course we had our poor woman who's effectively being manipulated by the charity the charity with the late night calls and the you know the uh, yeah so it so it's um it was wonderful to see the ambivalence and to see the light and shade of this technology i thought that the complexity uh, and the humanity is what really made the piece great there was a question over here just before the election David Cameron came up with a line about we shouldn't just be tolerant. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if they were going with that. Passive tolerance. Tolerant. Yeah, exactly. Muscular liberalism, people sometimes call yeah. it, or muscular something. Like. Um, yeah, all sorts of nonsense before the election. On the one, <laughs> on the one and it continues. I mean, I'm so sick of Magna Carta, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> if I see another one of these senior politicians banging on that Magna <laughs> Bloody Carta, <laughs> you know, in the words of that great legal philosopher Tony Hancock, remember Magna Carta, did she die in vain? <laughs> <laughs> So they go to running <laughs> meet and drink pims and champagne and everything, then they want to scrap yeah. the Human Rights Act. I mean, what's that about? Yeah. That's yeah. Orwellian. That's yeah. Orwellian. Yeah. I'm not supposed to use words like uh, Kafkaesque or Orwellian. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it in the theatre, though, can't you? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You can't, it's do, fine. It. You can't do it on current affairs TV, but you can do it on the theatre. Um, no, but Orwellian is that abusive language and that... Yeah. Contortion of it's not how many cameras you have in the street, that's not Orwellian to me. It's the politics of the English language, yeah. it's when we contort language to, 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 to pervert ideas and ultimately to oppress people. I think, and there was all sorts of stuff, wasn't there? There was the you know, the terrible stuff that happens in Paris, and all our senior politicians trooping off to Paris because je suis Charlie, right? And then we come back to England to say domestic extremism, we're going to take powers to tell universities yes. who can't have a meeting and the lecturers should spy on their students and the school teachers should spy on the kids and just je, je ne suis pas Charlie maintenant. <laughs> so, um, um, so and, 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 and now it, it, it continues but you know we have to, we just have to hold them to account. They had to stall on their, their, their plans to scrap the Human Rights Act because there's a conservative rebellion. And I want everybody to join Liberty and if they have a Tory MP to write to their Tory MP and say, join this rebellion because um, because we, we, we need our human rights act. Do you think it's likely to be scrapped? Do you think they'll get it through? Well, it's um, they will if they can. And there is a they've got to, they've got a majority in the House of Commons of twelve. And I think there are currently more than twelve Conservative MPs who have concerns about it. But then there's the wheeling and dealing right. of politics and all the things that you know that happen. But you know it is our number one priority at Liberty at the moment. And, but, and, and in order to to win, you need to have so many in the rebellion that when it gets crushed down, you know, um, because it's not quite it's not on the scale of you know you know we saw what happened when you know he comes home to the flat and I'm, I I've told them we're turning up at nine o'clock and we're recanting. It's not like that. 
but the whips, you know, parliamentary whips have their own means of, um, of getting people to change their mind about their principles. Yeah. And it's sometimes threats and it's inducements or it's just party loyalty. So it takes a really significant um, rebellion of conscience to, to actually just get a narrow a narrow defeat of government policy. I think it's, I think we can win, but we need all the help that we can get. Great, thank you. Um, that's probably all we have time for. I have one more very general question. Um, a lot of the work that we do here at the gate is about uh, galvanizing and about uh, encouraging people to think differently about the world in whatever way that might mean. Um, and I find, especially with pieces like this, we all start, our brains start whirring and we start to sort of recalibrate. And then we have that panicky moment where we go, oh, but I don't know what to do <laughs> about it, actually. Um, and I wondered if you might be able to talk a little bit about the ways in which we can affect change when we want to. Well, you know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, <laughs> yeah. please join Liberty. Please, please go to your favourite search engine, um, whatever it happens to be, and type Liberty. Type Liberty Human Rights, because otherwise you'll be distracted by the smart Piccadilly department. Yeah. <laughs> really good prints. And, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and we are the National Council for Civil Liberties, but we are con connected to sister organisations all over the world. There's a wonderful court case in the Supreme Court of the US just the other day on same-sex marriage, and we were able to intervene in that with other organisations. Our, our colleagues in Ireland have had their great success in recent times too. We've won um, a case uh, in London on behalf of lots of international human rights groups who were being spied on by GCHQ, and we've done that in recent weeks. But we can, in the end, we depend on on member support, but, but also, again, because of the beauty of this modern technology, it doesn't just have to be the support of the checkbook or the direct debit anymore. There are ways in which we can employ people to help in campaigns. We can send you lots of information and give you opportunities to, um, to, to, you know, to, to get involved, give you, and not just clicking a, not, not just clicking a switch and Go, you know, signing an online petition, but sometimes we actively ask you to lobby particular MPs on particular issues, write letters to local newspapers. All of these tools are still incredibly important, um, and uh, and politicians um, really do listen when they're when they're forced to. Mm. Wonderful, um, Shamashakabati. Thank you so much. Pleasure. For talking to us. Thank you.